Annie News came out with a new video about soul leveling on how guilds work. Tell me. Guilds and solo leveling are so much more than just a joint group of high-level hunters. Okay. Their revenue rivals even the biggest of corporations, they're part wow. of the strength of entire nations, and their influence enough to sway even governments. What makes guilds such an interesting topic to cover? The guilds are basically corporations. They're just big companies, right? Basically, it's just huge companies. Even like uh, Jin Ho's dad, the tr like the construction company, right? They're like, holy shit, these guilds make so much fucking money off these dungeons. We gotta get into business. Number though was the unique way in which they've been integrated into. Okay, yes, I really enjoy the way that the guilds, like the 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 hunters and like K-pop idol magazines, kind of like synergize together like in korea all these idols like for example if you see a magazine you see different idol celebrities right but in like the world of solo leveling instead of idols you have like these hunters who are like almost like revered like them right the solo leveling society everything from the way they treat hunters to the way they paparazzi hunting just makes sense in terms of how it'd be in our own society they've turned the very act of raiding into a business one that's by far the most profitable in the entire world now mm -hmm. so in a field where billions of dollars are at stake to get Honestly, the existence of these gates, yes, there is impending doom. If a gate break happens, people can come out and kill us. Hunters can also die, but, like, this is, like, almost, like, such a great thing that happened to these countries. Now, hear me out, right? If your economy is down and there's no, like, business being made, but these, like, gates open and you go in there and suddenly a shitload of money can be made, I'd imagine the countries in this world are so fucking happy that these gates exist because they are such a huge part of the economy to them. Now, the average anime watcher is not going to be thinking about stuff like this. But when I'm thinking about it from my boomer fucking business perspective, I'm like, holy shit, the existence of gates, these different currencies, the sustainability, like this is the best thing that could have ever happened to us, man. Guilds a gate was nothing more than an investment. It was a means to gain access and siphon any and all loot available from within them. Only after a strict four-stage process was completed four would stage? any high-level guild truly consider the gate they're raiding finished. So, it's that way these guilds are portrayed as fundamental- Bro, if all the gates just disappeared, straight up, recession. Cause like, that's where all the money is coming from, right? And if they, they, if they focus all their economy just on these like gates and dungeon farming, and it goes away, you're fucked! Really ...different from the more traditional fantasy guilds that makes me want to talk about just how much they are. Especially since in the anime they're slowly starting to become more prominent. We've seen hints as to the fame, power, and influence they possess, but in this video here I want to portray the full scope of just how much of it they possess. <laughs> Fan service. It'll be a spoiler-free breakdown of everything you need to know about them. Let's go. Now, since we are a... No, no Raid Shadow Legends ad? Re no, it's coming, it's coming, the web novel, yeah, here it comes. In. I'm wait, sure you've all seen wait, just wait. how much more both the novel and Bonwa has to offer. Yeah. They're both exceptional compliments to an anime that's being adapted. If only I had a website, some nice app I could, you know, use to get the fucking webtoon. Spectacularly. Yeah. I'm sure many of you have already read the Bonwa, but if you truly want to experience solo leveling and know everything about Sung Jin Woo yeah. in this world of hunters, to get to it, come on. all about it right here with today's sponsor, Web Today Spencer, Raid Shadow Legends, use your discount code and in use for your free ten pull and back to the regular content. Focus on solo leveling. For guilds, I think the best place to start is with what they do. Their primary purpose is to organize hunters and clear gates, but in the decade that gates have been around for now, they've grown from this vital institution that protects the people into something more like a hunter talent agency combined with the Guild Master Che here looks so devious, dude. He just looks like such a player, dude. Gate clearing business. They immediately headhunt any hunters that's rank B or above. Get them raid ready. Headhunt, right? Basically scout them. Poaching. That's why I thought uh, Manager Wu was looking for Sung Jin Mu to see if he was double awakened or not. Just to, like, you know, scout them and poach them fast. Be as fast as possible, then send them out to clear gates so that more money can be made and the process repeated. It's not the exact way it works. Recruit. Train raid, for okay. Every guild, but it seems the direct goal of most is to grow their ranks and accumulate power. power. Oh, here, here, here's the actual guilds of Korea, right? So we have like, grow, but it seems the direct. The first one is the Hunters Guild, right? Which is the most audacious name for a guild because, like, if you name your guild the Hunters Guild, then it's like it just sounds like the only guild that exists for hunters, right? That's what Mr. Guildmaster Che did, which is amazing branding on his part, right? Direct goal of most is to grow. Fame guild, yeah. These are like the top guilds, right? We got, we got the fame guild. And accumulate power. 
Probably. The white tiger is the um, guy that we see all the time, right? With the fucking, you know, with his fucking muscles and stuff. We saw him, yeah? Or which can only be a no, no, no. There's one more kill. There's one more kill. There's, there's one more. Power. It was kind of purple. Is this Song Jae-moo's guild? What is this? What, what is, it's, it's all purple. Like, what's going on? Which can only be attained through money. This is something that'll make sense a little bit later. But for now, just know that money and power go hand in hand with guilds. Okay. As for the way guilds acquire business, well, when a gate opens up, it's immediately investigated by the association. The associ What is the association? That is um the old man that we see all the time, right? The, the super jacked old man, right? Him with all the scars. So that's like that's like the that's like an organization that kind of has oversight, right? Over all the different guilds. Okay, so like the association kind of it's like basically it's like almost like a government body for like these hunters, and they go in and immediately scout, and then the other guilds which pretty much operate like different companies, I guess. Association measures the amount of magical energy being emitted from the gate. Then based on that, it'll assign the gate a rank. Okay. This rank would then EDC <laughs> Ek ba. EDC boss. Dictate okay. the gate's level of difficulty, and that alone would be enough for a guild to determine whether a gate was worthwhile or. Didn't they say this could be beyond an S rank dungeon in episode one, right? So there's gotta be like more than S rank difficulty, right? Not. Mainly because difficulty determines the level of monsters and the higher level of the monsters, the more valuable the loot. So it's when a gate is finally deemed worth doing by a guild that that's when they must partake in a bidding war in order to acquire the rights to it. They can't- So the money equals power part, right? So if you have more money, then you can bid for these gates and you can get it, right? But it's like such a, uh, it's it's competition, but it's predatory in nature because the big boys are always going to outbid and they're going to get the best one. They're going to get more money, right? And everything is just going to, they're going to get way more money. And all the lower guilds are going to have to bid for the lower ones. And that's all they get. So the big boys keep getting bigger and the small guys get the scraps. Just show up and walk in because until given a permit that says otherwise, all gates are fully owned and under the jurisdiction of the association. As the group that oversees all hunter activities in the entire country, they alone have the power to determine who can do what with gates. So, guilds bid against each other to acquire whatever gates they see fit, and the ones that remain are usually left to either freelancers or the association hunter. Basically the scraps. It's a standard process that typically leaves B and A rank dungeons to the larger guilds, okay. C rank dungeons to the small guilds, private parties, and freelancers, then D and E rank dungeons to the For hunters us. too weak to join anyone but the asso Damn. association. Too weak to join anyone but the association. The association sounded like some like some kind of entity for the hunters to like maintain them I, like a government body but it all, but now it sounds like you know this is like oh you couldn't find any partner for this like you know in school you, you, you fucking sorry that might be a bad example of it but i'm trying to say like all the shitty people go to the association because they can't join the big guild they're left out they gotta fucking deal with the scrap that sounds bad it's tough to say just how much each of these gates would sell for but we do know that the standard price for c ranks are between fifty thousand to seventy five thousand uh, this is a bid? You, you pay this much USD to secure that dungeon? Wait, wait, wait. Do you know that the standard price for C ranks are between 50... Price, as in you would profit from that this much money? Or it costs that much to bid for it? to $75,000. The return from them is at most 150000 Okay, okay. So you bid and then there's a potential for 150k profit. Gotcha, gotcha. So based on that... Not profit, revenue. Logic, you can expect guilds to bid upwards of 50% of what they plan to get back Cool, in cool. Then, as it is with most things in the hunter world, the money earned from gates goes up exponentially the higher rating it is, likely making B ranks worth somewhere in the millions, and A ranks Damn. I would expect to be up there in the hundreds of millions. Damn, what I the mean, fuck is an S rank then? Would billions? Be giving away twenty-two million dollars just to become a guild master. All right, thirty billion won is twenty-two point five million USD. That's the amount that Sung Jae Moo has been proposed, right? If we accept. Sorry, you guys can't see the subtitles below, but basically, twenty-two point five million USD. Jinwoo, imagine the bid, like, imagine, like, you're so broke, you can't afford anything, and this kid offers you, hey, 22.5 million USD right now, join my fucking guild, and clear these dungeons. I'd be like, yes sir, sign me up. There was just that much profit to be made. Now, I don't know the currency conversion from, like, the gold to our regular outside currency, right? Because gold is, like, the shit we gain from instance dungeon. It seems like a separate currency just for to buy shit in the shop. The gate clearing business. It's hard to convey exactly how much, Maybe but it's one the way to one. the novel describes it is that the profits are enough to rival even the largest corporations. <laughs>
Like, we're going to compare fucking fang companies. We're going to compare the top tech companies against, you know, hunters and, and solo leveling. There were copious amounts of money to be made from the sale of magic crystals, okay. corpses, and items like artifacts and runestones. Sure, you didn't have to be a hunter to deal in this type of business, but whatever transactions were made with them had to be done using a guild as an intermediary. They were a necessary middleman that formalized the sale of high-ranking goods like these. Right. Doesn't guild, like having joined a guild, I think Annie has talked about this before. Like if you join a guild, then you get like a, a better a cut of how much you would sell for the mana stones, I think. Or some Naturally, shit like that. this meant they received a cut of whatever was sold. So if you wanted to maximize profits and keep them to yourself, your best bet was to either join a guild or make a guild mm -hmm. of your own. Yeah, exactly. The only issue with that was that there were several rules that guilds needed to abide by. Yes, they did get plenty of benefits like reduction in tax when selling loot, but that and all the others came in exchange for being on call permanently. <sighs> on call permanently sounds like a fucking nightmare. Bro, I mean, I guess the grind doesn't stop, but goddamn. And then again, that is like the lifestyle of these hunters. You are putting your life on the line. It's not a 9 to 5. If there was ever a time when the association or government requested your aid, regardless of where you were or what you were doing, you would have to go whether you wanted to or not. Like the Jeju Island ant stuff. It's like, all right, guys, ants are breaking out. Everybody, everybody has to go. It's like, fuck! A guild simply could not ignore a summons from the association. If they did. So the association has absolute rule over the guilds at the end at the end in terms of ordering them and summoning hey you gotta go to this place and you gotta take them out i'm sure the penalty would be guild disbandment or even the loss of their hunter license really more than anything oh. the people responsible would have to deal with the disgrace of it all they would have lost their reputation as the protectors of the people and not a single nation on earth would trust them to be able to fight for them again huh is there like banished hunters then you know people that lost that got punished by the association now they're like banned basically kind of like i don't know you know like in naruto there's like the akatsuki you know, and they're like, they're like ninjas that have a, that's crossed their fucking sign on their, their headband. And they're like outlaws, you know, if, if there's like a hunter, you know, like a group of hunters, that's kind of like that, like dark hunters, that'd be kind of cool. Again. Like who's to say that they won't just ignore that call to act again. So while being in a guild definitely came with its perks, it wasn't a decision that came very easily for a hunter. What I mean is that because of the risk, the hunting part of the job came with, Choosing the right guild often- Hunters, fame, white tiger again. The, the purple one is? Fiend. There's a guild called Fiend. For the survival. And knights. All right. An interesting fact the main that top guilds. directly into this is that the success rate of clearing A rank gates is actually higher than the success rate of clearing lower ones. That makes sense. Because the A rank people, the people that's going to attempt A ranks are highly organized, like super competent guild that's been trained to perfect this, right? To make sure that we will clear this no matter what and make the profits. But like the lower rank ones, you know, they're just a bunch of fucking nobodies just going in for scraps. No organization, no coordination. So it, it does make sense. You may think that a less difficult raid would make it easier to be completed, but when the lower rank raids are being taken by guilds striving to make a name for themselves... That also means they're willing to put a whole lot more risk on themselves. Mm. This often means going in with underleveled and under-equipped hunters, general lack of synergy since some of the hunters likely haven't fought together. They're just basically super desperate. They just want the, the fame. They want to get out there, but there's like no organization, no teamwork, no synergy. They fuck up. Other than all-around disorganization okay. since the Guildmaster's sights are simply set on making money. This in turn leads to more accidents, and it's <laughs> those accidents which... Why did they do this guy so dirty? He got cut again. Place smaller guilds into a much more ambiguous situation when compared to larger guilds. It makes them have to constantly recruit new hunters, despite them not actually being the best fit or even the right level. Now, when a large guild does finally obtain the permit for a high-ranking gate, they know how much money is on the line for completing it and as hundreds of millions every resource possible into doing so. Not only will that turn into copious amounts of money for them, but by completing the raid without any hassle. Okay, Sanji, what the fuck? Guildmaster Che smokes a cigarette? He, he looks kind of cool right now. Don't smoke, kids. Whatsoever. It would show the association they're capable of doing more in the future. I mean, when you get to raids as difficult as the A rank, getting the permits for them was more... What was that? What was that? Is that, is that just a bad transition? What was this? I mean, when you get to raids as difficult as the... Was, was the ants in the past, the stuff that we saw in episode one, truly just A-level difficulty? I mean, it was a gate break. It's not like a... Well, the gate break happen due to a certain level gate but this is surely not a rank i thought this aunt she was like s or something the a rank getting the permits for them was more than just outbidding the competition 
you had to show your strike force was truly capable of it. So, when taking into consideration the difference in priorities between a small guild and a large guild, <laughs> it's only natural you as a hunter would feel more safe joining a large guild. Okay, yeah, these top tier hunters, look at all their armors and gear. Now they look like they're actually in like an RPG. But you know in like episode 1, all, all in the lobby, like everybody had like casual clothing, poofy jackets, jeans, you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's where the money difference comes from. Large guild. Small guilds tended to lose people. Yeah, look at, it, look at it, look at the small guild. They're all just civilian clothing. Look, regular hoodie, jacket, no armor, the shitty weapons. Often in pursuit of making it big, whereas large guilds focused on securing Damn, the big look scores at in a way that was streamlined and efficient. It's two approaches to what was essentially the same time. Great work, cameraman. Whenever Chahe in is in frame, Cameraman does not fuck around. Cameraman is on point, locked in. Ask yet, one was refined and the other rough. The former of which just happened to be the safer one. If I was to compare this difference to anything, it would be best to think of it like a startup versus an already existing mega corporation. Oh, that makes sense. Like, if a startup wanted to grow its business and cover its finances, it would have to take on clients it probably couldn't handle and constantly expand until it got to the point that it could handle them. Then you sell Generally, the company. that made their situation a whole lot more volatile, but it also meant they could expand their business faster. Now, exchange clients with gates and expansion with the constant recruitment of new hunters, and that's pretty much the relentless cycle. Oh, this is where we're going to see the demon thing again. Wait for it. All our guilds have to deal with. Wait for it. Where is it? Where is it? No battle with monsters. Uh, There's like a really high one. It's just one of ah, No, no, no. He, he cut it too quick. I think it's at the bottom here. I swear to God, there was like... Where is it? Oh, no, I can't find it. But it, there, in this specific episode, when he was scrolling, there was like a job. For like people who can control demons, I'm like, wait, demons, and then we saw the demon castle and stuff like that. Remember? Or guilds have to deal with. It's just when a small guild fails, they're also losing people, not just money. Now, I never thought about it like that, huh? Because like in a regular job, you know, like if you fuck up, like people don't die, but like to them, like a company is like startups, like they lose hunters, then they lo actually lose their fucking employees, right? I never thought about that. Unfortunately, choosing a guild wasn't a privilege every hunter had access to since at the end of the day, everything boiled down to rank. The E and D ranks were rarely, if ever, considered, then the C ranks were who the small guild recruiters would start lining up for. Okay, so C is like the minimum threshold for like to get picked up by a guild, I got it, okay. The B rank was where we start getting into large guild territory, and gotcha. it's here the hunters within start to get a true choice in things. They would either get an attractive offer granting leadership or part ownership with a small guild, or Fancy. a fat signing bonus as a standard rotation member in a large guild. Signing bonus? Really what? It was mostly up to personal preference. <laughs> Do we get like fucking stock bonuses? We get equity in the company, bro, on top of the fucking, you know, base salary and signing bonus? What, you're gonna give me fucking stock refreshers, bro? Like at invest for like four years and it's all backloaded so that you gotta stay in the guild for like the first, first and two years? Because all the, the significant gains in the stonks are gonna come for the third and fourth years, just like how we do it. <laughs> the two was would you rather be the head of a snake or the tail of a dragon head of a snake tail of a dragon uh i don't really understand this metaphor the a rank was where large guilds started to make substantial offers and along with it came the promise of things like fame and basically like head of a snake is like you're about to ascend into like the top tier but tail of a dragon is obviously your top tier but you're like the bottom end of that i guess that's that's the comparison right fortune Fame because you were guaranteed to be part of the guild's exclusive primary. Who the, who the fuck is this dude? Why, he looks like such a fuckboy. Everybody loves him. Look at the paparazzi. Everybody, all the cameras are just facing him. Every rating team bent, fortunate because the financial reward from high-ranking dungeons was immeasurable. Combine this with a signing bonus in the millions, and you've essentially established yourself as one of the most coveted hunters in the nation. Should any of these offers not be to your liking, though, the A rank was always enough to go independent and create your own guild. Or even like get poached by America? Is that what's happening? Because Huang Dong Suk, he left Korea to go to America, is what I'm assuming, right? For more money? Because American guilds were paying more than Korean? Is that what's going on? I guess it's beneficial to steal S rank, you know, hunters from different nations, right? It's like an arms war, you pay them more money. Is that what was going on? At that point, you were strong enough to attract competent enough hunters, and the money you'd make together would be enough to support a smaller medium guild. So, whenever looking at hunters at the A rank and above, hey, this joining guy, this a guild guy. wasn't really necessary for them since the money and power already came with the territory. 
what joining a large guild provided that no one else could resources was that potential of fame should you become part of the main strike force it's you just want the fame main strike force is that like pretty much like the clearing group in sao it's just like the top dogs you know basically like um bro you are responding to a question i asked 10 minutes ago mobile viewer confirmed yes so we understand what up you're gonna see my analogy. Don't worry. Wait, wait ten more minutes, and you'll see my explanation of head of a snake or tail of a dragon. Anyways, um, strike force is basically like I say with clearing group, right? Like the top dogs in the front lines. Okay. You see, unlike small guilds where the number of hunters was only enough for one strike team, larger guilds tended to have enough to have multiple. Cool. There was the A team, which consisted of the best the guild had to offer. Damn, and look at these fancy ass shields, dude. Alone would be the ones to go through and complete higher rank gates. The rest were teams of mid to low level hunters, and they would be sent to complete gates not worth doing by the main team. Occasionally, they would have stronger members lead raids with the weaker ones, but that was mostly for training so that the less experienced can become better. Okay. So, with a constant influx of rookies bolstering their ranks, there was always a need for veterans to help them get experience. A luxury the small guilds unfortunately couldn't afford, and is actually the core reason behind their increased number of accidents. And that's fucked up, right? Because, like, you have accent. <laughs> he keeps showing the same fucking panel of, you know, that guy getting cut, case. split open when trying to run away from the double dungeon. But basically, like, you know, larger guilds, they have the money and resources to recruit people. They can train them up and they can contribute even better. But it's like small guilds, they don't have any of that. And on top of that, people keep dying. So you keep losing talent, too. So, like, again, it's just like life. The big dogs, the rich get, keep getting richer. And then, and then the poor just keep getting poorer. What a, what a system. Their increased number of accidents. In any case, should you be strong enough to earn a core place on a large guild's A team, then that was the equivalent of being on the starting lineup for an all-star sports team. Damn. Your name would be known to everyone who was a fan of the sport, and your status as a celebrity pretty much cemented. Look at this, it's Cha Hei-in is pretty much an idol, dude. Everyone knows her. This is due to the amount Look at this of magazine. large guilds tend to get, and it's actually portrayed quite well in the anime. To explain a little bit more, though, the relationship between a hunter and a guild was pretty similar to that of an entertainer and a talent agency. Okay. The guild was the platform through which hunters became known, and the hunter was the star over which guilds would fight for. Then you would assume that there would be like an independent, like, I know, I, I guess the people that's not in guilds are like indies, right? If I'm thinking of like corporate VTubers and indies. <laughs> but there's, there, I wonder if there's like a guild created by guilds, you know what I mean? Instead of talent agencies, you know, predatory behaviors taking everything. So, say a new S rank hunter had just made Song Jin Woo, maybe? The amount of resources every guild would put in to recruit them would be limitless, and the coverage of what guild that person was going to sign would be incessant. But that's interesting, because Song Jin Woo, obviously, he's not. Well, I don't know what rank he is, but he's probably not S rank. Anyways, they're poaching, right? Because not, they, they're not going to ever bid on Song Jin Woo, because Song Jin Woo's going to be like solo guild, you know, in, in Jin Ho's guild, right? So, we're going to skip all that, I guess. It's an event that would attract the attention of the entire nation, and is actually the reason every guild tends to have one or two informants planted within the Hunter Association. What, what the fuck, dude? This shit, this shit straight up looks like a new fucking VTuber fucking debut, dude. Everybody just like slow waiting. It's just like, oh my god, new debut, holy shit, new generation cohort coming in. The nation, and is actually the reason every guild tends to have one or two informants planted within the Hunter Association. Since they're the first to know about everything Hunter-related, not only would an informant get more details on gates worth bidding on, but they'd also be the first to know about what Hunters were worth recruiting. The primary asset that makes guilds what they are in this world. Even if a Hunter wasn't going to sign with them immediately, just they might later. a relationship was an essential part of starting the process. Yeah, you, and then you poach them from a different guild later on, man. So, it's all this extra stuff in a field that should just be about killing monsters that really makes guilds so much more than what we usually get. I mean, they've even gone so far as to give us a subtle look into the dynamic between a guild's administrative staff and the hunters they manage. Since the number of capable hunters are finite, it wasn't so easy to replace them as it was with a regular worker. That being the case, the workers would always take extra care to mind the hunters and the mood they were in. They didn't want the regular to workers. make the hunter leave, since every hunter was a valuable part of making the guild larger and stronger. You would think that there would be some kind of like um, elitism from the hunters to regular workers then, huh? Like, come on, throw, throw my jacket, carry this shit, bag boy. It was an additional burden that only these non-hunter guild workers were privy to. Now, to finally focus on the actual act of raiding, this here was how the guilds capitalized on their investments. It was the core moneymaker of their entire operations, and the sole reason they could- <laughs> I love how Annie's edited this. 
Because, like, this is an anime scene, right? They're looking at the gate and the blue light. And then he edited, like, the money bills falling. I wonder if he does this shit by himself or he has an editor. <laughs> the sole reason they could grow to the size and scale they were at. Just like how it is in any business, though, the act of making money from dungeons had been refined to an art. A four-stage process that ensured every last bit of profit could be made from it. So, first the raid team would enter and eliminate okay. every monster aside Get the from loot. boss, then after that a retrieval team would go in and drag out all Retrie the monsters. Hey, in Kaiju 8, this is kind of like the main character, huh? Because like, you know, after the people go in and the Kaiju 8 trailer, you know, the guy was like cleaning shit up, or basically hauling shit out, okay? You, go, you got the raider, then you got the fucking retrievers. Next, a mining team would enter and extract mining whatever team? minerals and crystals were embedded into the wall. Okay. Then after that, the raid team... Maybe it's better to categorize the, 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 you know, the Kaiju 8 guys mining I don't really know, actually. ...team would go back in and finally kill the boss. Wait, what? ...minerals were embedded into the wall. Then after that, the raid team would go back in and finally kill the boss. Oh, we don't, like, kill the boss immediately. So we, like, go in and we just kind of do everything except kill the boss. Retrieve. Mine. Then we go back in to kill the boss. Thus closing the gate and ensuring okay. everything that could be sold for money would be sold for money. Whether it be bones, hide, flesh, or teeth, every single part of a high-level monster was deemed useful in some way. Right, the dungeon so would close. it was only after that and the crystals and the ores were siphoned from the dungeon that the guild would consider the gate fully conquered. Now what happens if you stay in a dungeon too long? You kill the, you kill the boss, let's say, let's say you don't leave, you just stay in the dungeon. And the dungeon closes. Are you stuck? Forever? Forever and ever? You're just gone? Forever? The fuck? It was the optimal process to ensure every ounce of profit could be made from it. That money would then be put into buying more gates and recruiting even more hunters, and it was through this loop that a guild would constantly grow itself. Exactly, and the more money you have, which again, that's how money equals power here, right? More money you have, the more you can have resources to, you know, or, you know, to auction, you know, for bids for different gates, you can recruit more talent, train them up. The stronger you get, the more money you'll get. It's a fucking cycle, right? So the strong gets stronger, the weak gets weaker. Forever expanding in hopes of one day becoming the largest guild in the entire country. That's not always the goal of every guild, but it is the general ideal for those. So I guess if they, if any news pointed towards White Tiger, as soon as he said it's not the goal of every guild, I'm going to assume that the White Tiger's goal is not that. Already large enough to compete for it. But yeah, that's the full extent of how guilds work in cool. solo leveling. Cool. A core aspect of the series that I think everyone should know about. Now we know. If you want to see more lore videos just like this, then yes. be sure to leave a like and let me know in the comments. I love this shit. Please, guys, go to Mr. Andy News. Go like his videos. Sub to his channel. He always gives such great breakdown without spoiling us too hard, right? So it's interesting to see how the guilds are basically corporations and there's a whole economy built on the gates. Like, it really adds to world building, huh? I think it definitely does more. Like, the guild system, I think it's obviously a lot more fleshed out than other... I, I, Isekai isn't really a good comparison, but because Isekai has many guilds, right? They don't really go that deep. But it's cool to see the solo leveling has such an in-depth mechanic of how stuff like this works.